Hi everyone, I hope that you're all doing well. Another video about Byung Chul Han. The two books that I have already discussed with you on this channel by Han are The Burnout Society and The Transparency Society. This video is about another book uh, published in 2017 by MIT Press, translated by the same translator, Eric Butler. This book is called The Agony of Eros. The Agony of Eros. And this book is about love. It is about how the way we think about love is impoverished, it is inaccurate, and it is fundamentally misguided. It is missing something, missing something truly essential about what love is. The way we speak of love in everyday conversation, the way we think about love in our culture, the dominant way of speaking about love. How do we speak about love? We speak of it as a goal, as a personal project, something that belongs to one person, maybe as an item on the checklist of our life's accomplishment, as something that we know in advance or we can know in advance, we plan for it, <laughs> and uh, then we go out and get it. These are, according to Han, wrong ways of relating to love, to thinking about love. The inability to grasp love is connected to our inability to see the drama of life, to see life in terms of a narrative. We see life as an image in terms of a picture, and with a picture, everything is there available. Everything is in, in its place at once. But a narrative is different. A narrative cannot be seen at once. The narrative is not available. All its elements and components are not there in one instance. So a narrative is, is different. It unfolds over time. It has hidden parts, and at any given moment, there are parts of it that are, that are hidden, concealed, unknown, ambiguous. Even at the end of a narrative, even at the end of a life story, there is still so much that is left hidden. At the end of my life, I can say, I don't know what would have happened if I had made a different decision at that crucial point in my life. So a narrative, thinking about life as a narrative, embraces its, um, the shadows of it or the, the ambiguities, the, the unknowns. This book, therefore, is about our blindness to love and our blindness to the possible impact of love on us in our lives. How love can transform us, how it can surprise us, how it can disarm us, how it can take us off course, show us things that we couldn't plan for, we couldn't prepare for. Is it possible to love without feeling in some sense helpless? And the discovery of love is tied intimately to the discovery of our limited power, limited control, and how that is not a problem, how that is an essential character of our life. So the second essay in this book is titled Being Able Not to Be Able, which is essentially about embracing our limited power and control. This essay argues how eros demands from us, how the erotic dimension of our life demands that we refuse the wish to have power and control over the other. This power and control is not just about action. So when we say, I have limited power, it's not just about limiting my, my activity with respect to the other person. It is also about our knowledge and knowing what we know about the other. That the limits of our knowledge also, um, we also need to embrace that. We also need to admit and acknowledge uh, the limits of our knowing with respect to the other person. When you love someone, you must recognize, be able to say that I don't fully know you. I don't fully understand you. That willingness, that willing acknowledgement is a part of love. 
When we demand power, by contrast, when we demand to have power, control, predictability, we are eliminating the unknown. We are eliminating what is new, what is truly a challenge to us, what is truly an invitation to, uh, from, from us to go beyond ourselves, to step outside of our ego, what is truly a risk. Because what it, without risk, love turns into an egocentric project, an egocentric arrangement. Imagine the person who knows exactly what they want from their romantic relationships. They have a checklist, maybe. They are fully in charge. This person is seeking in the outside world what they have already identified within their ego as part of what their ego wants, their, their own preferences, egocentric preferences. So it is already established what is going on, what is, what is supposed to go on within their, within their range of their ego and its preferences, what the ego is identified with and what it is tied to, what it is attached to. So they say that person says, for example, I'm the type of person who likes this type of man or this type of woman. That, or that person is my type. We heard things like that. This person is prepared to love what is already established in the ego. What their ego is already kind of covertly or within their own imagination. They have already said, okay, I am... I want to be with this type of person. Because this is already within the bounds of the ego, it is narcissistic. And the inability to transcend the ego is, according to Han, is something that inevitably turns to depression. The depression that Han diagnoses has to do with the tacit realization that we tacitly realize the problem, that no matter how much I expand my ego, or maybe a better, more accurate word would be inflate. No matter how much I inflate my ego, include things in it, include how, how much I expand my checklist, I cannot. I, in, in fact, I make it more difficult and more impossible to, to do the thing that is required from love. And that thing that is required is losing myself, going beyond my, myself, Positioning myself such that I can receive myself after losing, after that initial loss, I can be positioned such that I could maybe receive myself, recollect myself in the presence of the other. Recollect myself. And that is what Han describes in terms of, Han and others describe in terms of the gift of the other. That the, that I can receive myself again, find myself again after that loss because of the other, thanks to the other. The last paragraph of the book was the most moving for me and it was fitting because it reminded me of the friend who gave me this book as a gift. I'm grateful to him for the way this friend stimulates my thinking through a friendship that is real, that is strange and always partly hidden from my view. So it has a dramatic uh, component it has a narrative <laughs> because it cannot fit within my ego so thank you to my friend peter and thanks to all of you who stayed with me until the end of the video um, if you're interested in my reading group information is available below in the descriptions the link to the other previous videos on han's books that i made um, also available. Otherwise, take care and I will speak with you in future videos. Thank you.